Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Today we're here to discuss easy planning for software-defined storage. My name is Heather Oleg. I am part of the marketing team here at Western Digital, and I'll be serving as your moderator. And just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a question mark. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts during the presentation, please feel free to submit those at any time as we will be addressing them as we go throughout the webinar. Also on that right-hand side of the screen, there is an attachment section. Um, there's a PDF copy of the slides that you'll be seeing today, so feel free to download those, as well as some additional resources links that we'll be addressing um, in our talk. And without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Uh, we got two Steves for you today. So we're first joined by the founder and CEO of OS Nexus, Steve Umbenhocker, or sorry, Stephen Umbenhocker. And for the Western Digital side of the house, we have Steve Wilkins, who will run, who runs our data center infrastructure product marketing. And I will hand it over to Steve to get us started. Good morning, thanks Heather, and uh, and thanks the other Steve for uh, for being here too. Um, so today we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, about software defined storage um, and um, and perhaps de uh, demystify it a little bit. Uh, we've uh, we've got to the point with software defined storage that perhaps there's um, it's it's too late for people to ask exactly what it is. So perhaps we can we can help help with that. Um, and we'll talk about things like the difference between scale up and scale out, which again, you know, they're, they're, you, you hear those terms commonly and not everybody understands exactly what that means. So, uh, so Steve, let me, uh, let me hand it over to you and, uh, and tell us a little bit about, um, about um, uh, your particular view on uh, software defined storage. You bet. Uh, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, so uh, our, our product, Quantastore, uh, takes a, a particular approach to software-defined storage that incorporates a technology that we call grid technology. Um, and in the slides coming up ahead, we're going to go over, you know, what's the difference between scale out and scale up. Uh, but in, in our, our platform, uh, we've really been uh, building more and more technology to, to help uh, organizations manage their storage in a hybrid cloud environment or multi-site environment so that they can have all, all of that managed as one so that the complexity goes down and that they can really manage their storage like a utility and with that same kind of ease of use that they get in the public cloud. So a lot of that, that work kind of really concentrates around um, ease of use, uh, you know, the grid technology really kind of the core of that. And then from a capabilities, uh, the platform does file block and object all in one platform. So uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different uh, SDS solutions on the market, but usually they focus on just an uh, as an object pl uh, play or a block play. Um, but with Quantastore, you're able to do uh, all the different types of storage. You can use blocks, you know, provision block storage for virtualization, and use file and object for other use cases like archive and Veeam backups. Um, and then uh, the other kinds of key things about the platform is all the work we do around security. Uh, and security features. We just finished our FIPS certification that went over to NIST for final approval from the government. Um, so we're, we're waiting on that, that, that paperwork to finalize. So we're really excited about that. But we've done a lot of work to make the platform compliant to a whole bunch of government security standards so you can use it in all kinds of different use cases. And then um, the platform is, is bare metal installs. And what's that mean? what that means is that it, it installs right onto the server as an operating system. So that you don't need any, you don't need to pre-install Linux or Windows or anything like that. Quantastore is li Linux-based, and we provide this ISO image so that you can just turn the server into a storage uh, storage system. And then you can run it on one appliance, but you can also, more often, uh, many appliances are combined together to form clusters that are highly available. And we use a an open storage foundation. And what I mean by that is that rather than building a, a new file system that hasn't uh, uh, that that's uh, that's proprietary and sort of locks uh, locks one in as a customer to a particular uh, proprietary technology. We're using Ceph and ZFS underneath, and we add a lot of technology to that uh, so that you get uh, something that is that is really going to be innovative uh, for decades to come. 
that's great, Steve. So um, with these these uh, scale up and scale out solutions, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the the different use cases for uh, for each as you explain them. Yeah. Um, so there's there's really if you take a look at at any storage system that's on the market today, whether it's software defined or not, you really find they fall into two categories. There's the scale out category and then the scale up category. More often, the traditional SAN NAS appliances are more of a scale up architecture, though there are a few that are scale out. And what scale out means is that you keep you, you combine the storage media, the network and the CPU. Basically, you keep adding more and more servers to add capacity and performance to the configuration. So it's got some really nice um, uh, features in that way because you can just typically keep you're able to keep scaling without bounds. Uh, but there is a minimum. You typically need somewhere around four servers, uh, depending on on the architecture. With Quantastore, you can you can start with as few as three servers with the uh, scale out uh, configurations. Um, but they generally do cost a bit more because there are a lot more servers involved. That means more processors, more RAM, and there's network connectivity between all of those systems. Uh, so they're a little bit more complex, and they also do require more network ports. So there's a little more cost. Um, for scale out storage clusters that's generally um, uh, out, when you start getting bigger with the scale out clusters that, that the cost those extra costs uh, sort of fade away um, but generally when you're under a petabyte a scale up cluster is a little bit more cost efficient and so what you see there on the right is a scale up storage cluster and these basically you use two servers and they are highly available where the storage media uh, is formed into a pool. And if that pool happens to uh, need to fail over to the other server because the one that it's active on is turned off, it'll automatically move over to the other server. So it's an active passive architecture, uh, but it's a little bit more cost effective when you're under a petabyte. And the scale up configurations on the, that you see there on the right, those do file and block. Um, the ones on the left, the scale out, that'll do all three, file, block, and object. And the way that these, these grow is just by adding more and more uh, storage <clears throat> to them. On the left, those, uh, the storage, those, those boxes that make out the store, scale out storage cluster, those are actually servers. That's the Western Digital Serve 60 plus 8, so it's a server with 60 bays of, of capacity in it. Whereas on the right, what you're seeing as, as we expand is a JBOT, the Western Digital Data 60. So a little bit more cost effective uh, to use a scale up, up uh, uh, cluster when you're in that, you know, uh, below a couple of petabytes. Um, but the scale out can be really efficient as well. And the scale out's the way to go uh, for object storage configurations. And this, these two architectures really apply across everything that you'll see out there in the industry. That's cool, and then you can uh, you can actually put these these together into uh, into a grid, can't you? That's exactly right. Yeah, and that's a great uh, segue here. So when you take uh, uh, with Quantastore, we really you know that that focus on ease of use uh, means that uh, we we don't want you to have to deal with storage silos. That's been kind of a a long time problem in the storage industry is. When you're ready to go expand uh, to add storage to another site, it's really been uh, a, a real headache from a security perspective, a headache from an activity perspective. How do you see how much capacity is available uh, in all your different locations? And the grid technology eliminates all that complexity because it combines all the systems together into a, into a common management control plane and the grid uh, is accessible, that management interface is accessible on every single system. So you don't have to log into a particular system or set up a virtual machine to manage everything as a grid. It's literally built into every single uh, server uh, that, that's running, every single Quantastore server. So when you are ready to expand at another site or in the same site, you can just keep adding more and more Quantastore servers uh, to the grid and it's still all managed as one. And within the grid, you can have multiple clusters. And, the, and one of the really nice things about having all of the storage in a, in a grid, not only from a security enforcement perspective, 
But from just ease of setting up uh, things like remote replication or multi-site, uh, active active object storage, all these kinds of things really require uh, interactivity uh, between these different clusters, these different pools of storage. And the grid management just takes all the complexity out of that. So it really turns it into a utility so that as you deploy storage in more and more locations, uh, it's really it's, it really is like one system. You get uh, alerting and reporting and, and all of that as if all of these different systems are just just one. That's great. And, being, and of course, being able to manage across all of that makes it very much easier for those storage administrators. Yeah, yeah, you you know a lot of a lot of challenges uh, that we've seen out in the field with organizations where they'll have storage in a particular site and they will have forgotten about it, and so it's tough for them to keep uh, you know uh, keep that utilization high where you know they're getting the most out of all of their systems, uh, and and sometimes uh, there's challenges around you know. Uh, if you go and update the passwords on one box, it doesn't go and apply to all the others. But with the grid technology, um, you can uh, connect the grid to your uh, local Active Directory or open LDAP and have single sign-on. And then there's a really powerful role-based access control system in Quantastore so that you can uh, really easily control what uh, operations each administrator can do. There's some nice multi-tenancy features in there as well, so you can start to uh, take resources and give them to different teams or or uh, organizations uh, within the within your uh, within your company. Very good. Um, and then being being able to uh, to kind of compose all of this together, um, that's all part of the, uh, the the management software too. That's right. Yeah. So is Quantastore bare metal installs on. Really, all of the major servers, we have certified Quantastore on uh, Western Digital, of course, uh, but also we use Quantastore with head nodes that are attached to Western Digital JBODs. You can use Dell, Supermicro, uh, Cisco, HP, uh, Intel servers. And so uh, you've got a, a, a lot of flexibility there. And you can actually have different vendor uh, vendors all in the same grid, so you could have uh, some with using Intel servers and others using uh, Dell servers with AMD processors. So you really get this ability to kind of mix and match, uh, and and that can be really, uh, really cost effective as you start to grow the grid. Uh, you can really uh, uh, have have that flexibility to kind of use other servers uh, in your environment interchangeably as compute and storage. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this slide, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Western Digital around their OpenFlex uh, uh, NVMe over fabric systems. And so um, I wanted to just touch on that a little bit. We're really excited about the, the uh, NVMe over fabrics and, and the whole op OpenFlex lineup. Western Digital has two different systems in that OpenFlex family today. There's an F-series uh, system and then this new Data24 that's coming out next year. And Quantastore uh, can also run where there's no internal storage except for the boot devices, which you're seeing on the right is a bunch of Dell servers. And then you can go and get storage uh, dynamically delivered uh, to those Quantastore servers and turn that into clusters. So that's, that's what this slide's really all about, is uh, dynamic storage orchestration of NVMe over uh, fabrics uh, environments and, and so this is this is some new capabilities you'll be seeing in Quantastore next year is this uh, automatic uh, orchestration of uh, uh, of uh, NVMe over fabric, specifically the Data24 unit. And so the really nice thing about that is is that you don't really have to worry about do I have enough slots in my server to go and expand the cluster. You can just keep adding more and more storage capacity to to the racks and have that be separated from the compute power used for the storage cluster. So that independence really makes for great flexibility. And what you see here is where if you have an environment where maybe it's an HPC or a research environment uh, where you, you need a, a lot of uh, agility, you can just say, hey, I, I, I'm going to go provision a cluster for this, this department and stand that up and configure that really easily uh, 
through a lot of orchestration that that happens you know uh, through some really simple to, easy to use dialogues within Quantastore. That's great. Um, we've got we've got a lot of, of uh, story specialists on the on the line here, so uh, maybe we can go back to scale up and scale out and and talk about touch on some of the key features of uh, of each of them. You bet. Um, the the uh, scale out clusters these do file block an object. So what that what that means is file means that it does the uh, standard NFS and SMB protocol. Uh, and of course, all the standard things like snapshotting and and, and all of that. Um, the uh, oh yeah oh sorry yeah I jumped to the wrong slide here. So let me go over the scale out first, and then we'll go into more of the detail on the on the on the scale. Uh, sorry, the scale out, and then we'll go into the scale up. Um, but yeah, so this the, you can do all the different file protocols here, and the the scale out clusters. Uh, besides being able to do NFS, SMB, iSCSI, and Fiber Channel, because we're using Ceph technology, you can also use the native protocols. And there's some advantages to doing that. So with uh, with Ceph, there's a RBD block protocol that is directly supported by OpenFlex and, or not OpenFlex, but uh, OpenStack and some other um, uh, hypervisor stacks. And that does a fan out. The client will communicate to all the various nodes and gives you a performance gain as you add more and more uh, nodes and you scale out your, your storage cluster. Uh, with uh, There's also a scale out file capability in there where you can talk the native protocol there. CephFS has got a native client and it also does a fan out. So whenever you can, whenever you have the opportunity to use the native client, whether that's the native client for file or block, uh, that's a great way to go, and those do require that that uh, your the client side be Linux, uh, but in in those cases, but for kind of all the other systems out there, these configurations support all the standard protocols: the SMB uh, uh, for Windows, NFS for Linux, and then iSCSI and Fiber Channel for block storage delivery. The other bit on this is the S3, so you can go and set up I, I, these scale out configurations as object storage clusters and deliver the S3 interface through every server. And we've really seen that that is the, the key way to, to deploy these, is to run uh, the S3 uh, service on every single node, because it increases the performance linearly as you add more and more of, of those systems. We're even doing some, some interesting things for our next release uh, around running multiple of those S3 gateways per node, because uh, there's there's more uh, performance to be to, to to be delivered by just adding more instances of that. But uh, but yeah, these 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 configurations are highly scalable. Uh, you can you know rack by rack using the Western Digital uh, Serve 60 plus eight. You can do about 7.5 to to eight petabytes per rack uh, using about nine or ten of those nodes per rack, and uh, you can get to some really high densities with the Data 24s using the 15 uh, terabyte uh, SSDs. That's great. And on to um, scale up. Yeah. So the scale up. Uh, this is more of a traditional architecture. Quantastore has uh, built into it both the support for doing scale up style storage pools as well as the scale out. The scale up we use OpenZFS technology underneath, and then all of Quantastore's you know uh, encryption management and and high availability system around it. So we we add a lot of capabilities to to uh, that underlying ZFS technology. Uh, and it it delivers iSCSI, Fiber Channel, SMB, NFS, and and just like with the scale out architecture, um, you can do these protocols all at the same time on the same storage. So in the uh, in a scale out config that we were going over before, you can do file block and object all at the same time on the same devices. Here, the same thing. You can do both SAN and NAS protocols at the same time on 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 these pools. So what you see on the left is two servers at the top. That's just a, a standard Intel uh, server connected to four uh, data 60 or data 102 uh, disk chassis. So these configurations, we typically will take upwards of 600 devices per cluster pair. And that'll get you uh, nowadays with the 18 terabyte drives over eight petabytes per cluster. So you can do some really big configurations here. Uh, with the grid technology, you can keep those configurations a bit smaller so that you're not 
getting a bottleneck at, at the, at the uh, server up, uh, because these scale up architectures, all of the IO goes through one of the, of, of the servers for a given pool. And so what we end up doing is oftentimes we will create two pools so that both of the servers are active at the same time. So you get more of an active, active configuration. But, but yeah, these are, these are really cost effective because the, um, the, they only require a pair of servers. And so they're really ideal for a lot of use cases like Veeam backups, archive. And then with the all flash configurations, you can use them really effectively for uh, use cases like virtualization. Uh, so th these are um, uh, just really uh, flexible and a, and a great way to solve certain, uh, certain use cases uh, really cost effectively. That's great. And um, uh, these, these, uh, these products you've been talking about, um, if I can, if I can just, uh, uh, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about, um, uh, the, 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 the Western digital platforms, uh, storage platforms that we have, um, you've mentioned actually three, three products, the ultra star serve 60 plus eight, which is a, a very dense storage server, a uh, very high ratio of storage to compute, uh, which is great for Seth. Um, and then two JBODs, uh, a 60 bay and a 102 bay. And the key thing about all three of these products is that they were designed as a, as a family of, of products with a lot of common features, in particular, a couple of, a couple of, of core technologies that are unique to Western Digital. Uh, Arctic Flow that manages the, the internal temperatures of the, of the drives very successfully. Um, and isovive, which uh, which re reduces dramatically the amount of vibration in a in a um, in a box that affects the the performance of the drives over time, um, and in the resources um, attached to to this this file, um, you'll you'll find a um, a link to a YouTube video that explains all of that. So I'm not going to go into that now. Um, I know you'll be relieved to hear that, but uh, check out that uh, that YouTube video. It's uh, it's a pretty great, good explanation. Um, and then, really, the the combination of these things together. If I can just jump ahead to um, something that that uh, OS Nexus and Western Digital have been working on together, is a configurator uh, for both scale up and scale out. And Steve, perhaps you can uh, talk us through some of this. Yeah. Um, in fact, why don't I just do uh, do a quick demo of that here? Uh, the the configurators really uh, makes it easy to design uh, scale out and scale out uh, Western Digital Quantastore uh, solutions. You can go to that page. I'm going to show you uh, a page here on the Western Digital website. Share my screen here. This is under the Technology Alliance page at Western Digital. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see these two configurator tools that have been customized uh, uh, around the, the platforms we've been, uh, the Western Digital platforms we've been talking about today. So I'm just going to click on the one for configure, configuring a, a scale out cluster. And um, the, the idea behind this utility is really kind of uh, give you uh, the ability to design these solutions by having a lot of the solution engineering uh, knowledge put into an application that's available on the web that you can then go and and uh, uh, and and you know design systems for different use cases with and, and really uh, get a design that's going to be on target or at least pretty close to the bullseye um, uh, to begin with. So the way it works is you uh, input a, a usable capacity that you need. And then it will go and calculate all the rest uh, based off of a given use case and, and sort of the design parameters down below. So uh, here, I'll go and enter like a couple of petabytes. And uh, it goes and, and kind of recalculated already uh, some changes to the server specification uh, to go meet that, re that requirement. And then you can, you know, you can adjust it uh, 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 further just using the, the, the slider. This next bit is, is a use case. So it, rather than having to have knowledge of all the different kind of options down below, uh, this is just sort of a quick configurator. So if you need like large scale archive, this is going to go and use an erasure coding level that's a bit uh, a longer stripe size. If you choose like uh, desktop and server virtualization, this is going to go to more of a replica model. So the usable capacity is going to be a bit lower, but you're going to get a higher IOPS with that. So th this is a great way just by uh, 
um, you know, choosing uh, the use case and the needed capacity, you're going to be pretty close to the mark. Um, but the uh, uh, the next bit here is gives you some ability to further customize that. You can try it out and see how much hardware is required. If you increase the drive size, that can make the configuration a bit more dense and then reduce the cost by requiring fewer servers. And then generally, uh, these units, you're going to want to fully populate the journal and metadata device to eight. Um, and for you know bigger configurations, good to go with like a 1.92 terabyte SSD. That journal and metadata is to offloading the, the writes and, uh, and also putting the, uh, the underlying file system metadata into a flash tier. And that makes, uh, that really uh, greatly boosts the performance of the overall solution. So uh, that's, that's uh, you know, just generally want to have eight, eight of those devices per, per server. And then down below, if your data is not compressible, you'd want to turn that bit off. The backfill, the system completely auto heals itself. So uh, you want to have some space reserved uh, so that it can do that auto heal activity. Typically, you want that to be around 10 to 15 percent uh, of, of reserved space for just auto healing. And then uh, this reserved drive slots. What this is for is if you want to populate the servers only halfway full because you want to expand in, in the near term with by adding just more drives, uh, you can just reserve some slots. But you can also just expand later on just by adding more servers. So it, the reserve drive slots is, is uh, more helpful if you're going to be expanding again within the first year. Uh, then you then you can have that ease of just putting putting more drives uh, into the units and and uh, that these the the JBODs and these serve sixty plus eight that that Arctic flow and and the other technologies that Western Digital has built into this we've really seen uh, a huge uh, uh, reliability gain versus other systems uh, in the field we've got some customers. Uh, uh, many customers using the data 60s and just the, the rate at which um, drives need to be replaced is, is super low, uh, just uh, astonishingly low. So those the, that whole anti-vibration and, uh, and, and other things that, that go into the, the hardware it has just a, a huge impact. And so that just makes 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 everyone's uh, life that much easier in terms of, of maintenance. But but anyways, that's kind of the, the uh, uh, quick overview of the utility. And then at the bottom, you can click request quote, and it will go and uh, send that uh, to Western Digital to get more information. The configurator, the URL up at the top, you can pass that around. So if you want to share that with uh, with your uh, Western Digital VAR and, uh, and and adjust the design with them, uh, all the stuff is saved right into the URL so that you can uh, uh, easily collaborate. We have another design utility that's for the scale out. It's on that same page. and the last bit I wanted to, to mention is just the uh, Quantasaur's got this uh, auto, the zero touch maintenance feature that we're uh, introducing this week. We've got uh, Quantasaur 5.8 coming out, and so one of the common things is you've got to replace drives when they when they wear out, and uh, and now when you pull a drive and put a new one in, it's just going to automatically heal. It's going to do all the management operations for you. So typically in previous versions of Quantasaur, you'd have to go in and mark it as a hot spare. Now you can turn on an auto maintenance policy that says, oh, if you replace a bad drive, automatically take care of everything for me. And then it just sends an alert uh, to you when it's done uh, uh, and when it starts doing the auto heal. So really, really nice. And that, that kind of goes to all the work and, and our focus on just ease of use and making it really easy to build private clouds and, uh, and, and uh, these multi-site uh, configurations. Thanks, Steve. That's great. I think, um, given the um, uh, we're we're coming up to time here, um, Heather, do we have any any questions come in? Um, yes, we have had a couple questions come in. So let me just take the first couple that I see. Um, okay, so the first one it says, um, is the S three storage fully compatible with AWS S three? Yeah, we're using a, a Ceph technology underneath for the S3 uh, uh, scale out for the scale out configuration for the S3 uh, 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 technology. And Ceph has got uh, of the best uh, uh, S3 compatibility uh, uh, of, of any system out there. So kind of uh, for those that are uh, less knowledgeable about object storage, 
um, Amazon's uh, simple storage service, or what's called S3, is sort of the industry standard for object storage. They established a protocol many years ago for interacting with object storage. And uh, when uh, Ceph has been around for over a decade now, and it has built into it an, an object storage uh, uh, capability so that you can take the whole cluster and turn that into uh, S3 object uh, storage as if you were running your own Amazon cloud. And so that's really useful uh, if you're building out a content delivery network or a large archive uh, 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 system. And what, you've, what we've seen happen over the last uh, several years is pretty much every backup product on the market now supports doing backups to object storage. And so we see, uh, besides content delivery network use cases, we see a lot of companies moving to object storage for their backups because all you have to do is add more and more uh, storage servers to the, to, the, uh, to the grid and the cluster there um, to, to add more capacity. So it just makes it really easy to go and house, uh, just, uh, house data and expand basically without limits. Perfect. Um, let's take the next one. Um, and just being mindful of time, we'll make this our last one and then we'll get back to all of you guys who we didn't get to. Um, so it says, when designing a solution via the web apps, are these fixed configurations or can they be further customized? Um, you, the, these uh, are totally customizable, yeah. So the, uh, when you look at the design utility, what you're gonna see uh, on, the, on the far right is a, a general specification, that, that general recommendation, and you can kind of look at that as sort of a, a reference uh, configuration as you go through the process of, of designing a system. But it, it just kind of does best guess for some of these settings. The, the most commonly adjusted setting is the, net, is the, uh, is the network setting. And, and so here it's recommending you know, a dual port 25 gigabit ethernet, but you could use dual 40 or you know, uh, dual 100. So you've got a lot of different uh, things that you can go and adjust. The, uh, depending on what the use case is, we might adjust the RAM and the, and the CPU a little bit, um, but generally um, the, uh, uh, the, the server specification, you'll find that it's, that it's on target um, you know, for the selected use case and everything. So it doesn't generally require much more uh, configuration adjustments besides uh, oftentimes the, the network piece. Perfect. Um, well, since we are running at time, um, I'll go ahead and close this out um, for today. Thank you to uh, both Steve and Steven for sharing all that information with us today. Um, just wanted to give you guys one final reminder that a PDF copy of the presentation is available for um, in that attachment section, as well as both the links to the different configurators and that YouTube video. So please feel free to click on any of those or um, I'll be sending out a recap thank you email at the end of today. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have a copy of all of those things in there as well, as well as a link to um, the on-demand version of this webinar. Um, so with that being said, um, I, um, and then as well, we'll get to any questions that we didn't, Steve, Steven or myself will reach out to you. So on behalf of OS Nexus and Western Digital, we just wanted to say one final thank you to all of you guys who took time out of your day to join us. And with that, I will sign us off until next time, goodbye everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.